Hi, everybody. Well, I'm so excited about this new teaching series, A Better Way. And I love the topics we're going to be covering, like a better way to disagree and a better way to peace. This week, we'll be going over a better way to repentance. If you didn't hear Pastor Steve's message um, on this, I encourage you to check it out. He talked about John the Baptist, who prepared the people for the Messiah. John was a sight to behold. He dressed in odd clothes and ate unusual food. And he was the first prophet for Israel in 400 years. He blasted both Herod and the religious leaders of the day, which won the respect of the common people. But John had strong words for those who listened. His main message, we are all sinners and need to repent. He didn't just call out Herod and the religious leaders of the day, but he was calling all people to repentance. His message was powerful and true. John was calling people to personal and corporate repentance. Personal repentance has to do with our own repentance for uh, our sins, while corporate repentance has to do with the collective repentance of a whole group of people or a whole community of people. Throughout the Bible, we see God more often than not views sin through the communal or corporate lens. It's true that sin also is viewed by God based on a personal individualistic lens. However, more frequently, God views sin through this communal lens in Scripture. We see this a lot in the Old Testament. Think about all the prophets that have been sent up from God to tell the nation of Israel again and again to turn from their ways and to follow after God. This wasn't a one-time event. It happened over and over again. The prophets uh, were talking to the whole community of Israel, calling them to corporate repentance. Sometimes that's hard for us to recognize in our individualistic American thinking. But a great example of this is found in the book of Ezra from the Old Testament. In this book, we read how the people of Israel had become unfaithful to God. They had followed the forbidden practices of the surrounding nations like the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. Ezra, who was a priest and a scribe, was personally innocent of the, these sins that were committed by the people, but he still felt the weight and the guilt and the shame. He prayed, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and disgraced to lift my face to you, my God, because our sins are higher than our heads and our guilt has reached to the heavens. See how Ezra acknowledged and lamented the truth of the sins of Israel? See how that acknowledgement and lamentation connected him with the guilt and the shame of that sin. And identifying with the guilt and the shame, Ezra cried out to the Lord. We see another example of this with the prophet Daniel. Daniel identified uh, with the guilt and the shame of his people. Israel had been unfaithful to the Lord, and because of that unfaithfulness, Israel was in ruins. And this continued on for another 70 years. Daniel heard from the Lord, and as he did, he felt the weight of the shame and guilt. He confessed, O oh Lord, and our, and our kings and our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. Like Ezra, Daniel had been personally innocent of the offenses against God, but he did not try to distance himself from the collective sin of his people. He owned his part as a member of the community. In both of these passages, they were personally innocent of the wrongs, but they came under the guilt and the shame nonetheless. They allowed that shame and guilt to draw them to acknowledgement and lament. Lament. That's not a word we use often today. It means a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. In the Bible, we see a connection between lament and repentance. King David might be one of the best examples of this. Many of us are aware of his sin with Bathsheba. He slept with Bathsheba, another man's wife, and she became pregnant. And to cover his sin, he sent her husband to the front lines of war to die. In the mess of all of this sin, in the middle of all of this brokenness, the prophet Nathaniel comes to David, 
bringing word that the judgment of the Lord would visit him. Through, uh, though David deserved to die, God spared his life. Instead, Nathaniel said, the child born by Bathsheba would die. The weight of this news was too much for David to handle. Grieving deeply, he sought God's mercy on behalf of his child. He pleaded to God for the child, fasted and spent nights laying in sackcloth on the ground. His friends stayed with him and, and they tried to get him to, uh, get him to come up from the ground, but he wouldn't and he wasn't eating any food. And in his lament for his sin, David wrote Psalm 51, a song of repentance and pleading for God's forgiveness. It opens like this. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. In the Psalm, we see how lament propelled David to confess his transgression how it led him to fall on God's great mercy and compassion. What's the purpose of lament? Well, it allows us to connect with and grieve the reality of our sin and suffering. It draws us to repentant connection with God. And in that suffering, lament also serves as an effort to change God's mind, to ask him to turn things around in our favor. Lament seeks God as a comforter, a healer, a restorer, and redeemer. Somehow the act of lament connects us with God and leads us to hope and redemption. Our culture is uncomfortable with lament. Like we're not encouraged to share about our pain publicly. We're encouraged to mourn quietly and in private. But there's a great value in lament. And we shouldn't stop our lament before it runs its course. And lament needs a response. It needs a response from God and from us. American culture uh, tells us not to sit in our sadness and in our pain. But in reality, that's pretending that everything is okay. And that's being fake with our feelings. And God doesn't want us to be fake with our feelings. He wants all of us, all of our emotions, even our sorrow and our despair, and our grief. He wants to hold us close. He wants to wipe every tear from our eyes. He cares about the parts of us that are crushed and exhausted. And he wants to use our grief to bring us closer to him. And in that closeness, he wants to change us, to change our hearts and to send us to do his work. David's lament meant sitting in the sorrow uh, for the pain that he had caused feeling all the emotions for those sins, seeking God's forgiveness, and then asking him to change his mind. But when his son finally passed, David rose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. He went to the house of the Lord and worshiped. His time of lament prepared his heart for reconnection with God. It prepared him for action for reconnection with the people around him. It prepared him for the praise, even in the darkness. Lament helps us see the truth and helps us connect with God and our neighbors. Well, that's it. I hope this helps you have a great discussion in your group this week and helps you take your next step with Jesus.